Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd Allahumma inni a'udhu bika in ushrika bika wa ana ala mustaghfiruhin li min alamu So A very very beneficial Book or treatise written by our Sheikh Sheikh Ibrahim Rahili Hafizallahu Ta'ala is something I'd like for us to read through Bidnillah Ta'ala and try to gain some benefit as it deals with some very very important subject matter and subject matter that concerns especially the youth of Ahl Sunnah and in fact the students of knowledge and the du'at those people called to to Islam and call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it is nasiha, you know, it is advice. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Adina nasiha, Adina nasiha, Adina nasiha, Qalu liman ya Rasulullah, Qala lillahi wali rasulihi wali a'im Lillahi wali rasulihi wali a'immatul muslimin wa a'amatihim. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the religion is advice or the religion is sincerity. And he mentioned that three times illustrating the importance of, you know, advice and also being sincere in the in the in the religion, but advising one another and, and meeting the rights of one another, this right of advising. <clears throat> and then the companions, they asked, uh, for who, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, for, uh, for Allah and for the Messenger and for the leaders of the Muslims and the general Muslims. And so it illustrates for us that the the importance of advising, the importance of meeting the rights and having sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because when we have nasiha, the nasiha to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's having knowledge of Allah and it's uh, being sincere to Him in your worship. And the treaties that I wanted to read from it's called Nasiha Lish Shabab Min Ahl Sunnah. It's called Advice to the Youth of Ahl Sunnah. So, this treatise is advice specifically to the Salafiyin. And in fact, the Muslims in general, everyone can benefit from this, but this was written specifically for Ahl Sunnah, for the Salafis. And when we seek nasiha, and when we seek uh, answers related to questions pertaining to Islam, that we should also have a sincere intention in asking for that advice, that we really, in fact, want to, you know, clear up something that we're, we're, we're confused about, or we want to attain knowledge. So questions, when we question and we ask questions, from the manners of asking questions, is that we do not, uh, that we do not want fitna. We do not want trials and tribulations and problems to become between us and others, or to stir up trouble. And that we also are not asking questions just to prove an opinion, but in fact, you ask a question so that way to to clear up things that you are unclear about. And when we seek nasiha, and when we give nasiha, when we give advice, we should have sincerity to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and it should be in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as with all of our deeds. So the book that we will go over on nasiha by Sheikh. Ibrahim al-Rahili Allah Ta'ala was, was written due to the need of the youth around the world and was written as a response to questions the Sheikh received 
from students of knowledge around the world, specifically students of Ahl Sunnah, stu stu uh, Salafi students of knowledge around the world, related to issues that are problematic and required additional research and looking into due to some of the divisions and differences pertaining to certain masail or certain issues. So some students asked the Shaykh, Hafizallahu Ta'ala, to make a tape to deal with differences, you know, to deal with some of these differences regarding these issues. So the Shaykh believed that it was more beneficial to write this advice as it can only, uh, as, you know, it would spread easier to the people and it would also have a lasting effect and be preserved. Whereas if you record lectures and so forth, they are not as uh, necessarily long lasting, although, you know, technology is changing. But this is also the path of the early scholars is that they wrote uh, books and they wrote treatises that have been passed through the generations of Muslims. <clears throat> the Sheikh said it is imperative to know who this treatise was written for. So this is very important. As it says, Nasiha li shabab min ahl sunnah, that it is advice for the youth of ahl sunnah. So the Sheikh said that you you must know, a person must know who this was written for. So that as uh, as some people claim, there are individuals out there who have claimed that and and this dispels by by having knowledge of why it was written or who it was written for this will dispel the claim of those individuals who uh, perceive this treatise as a way the sheikh was trying to come closer to the people of innovation but rather it was written for ahl sunnah so it was not written as um, necessarily advice or giving you these principles as ways of these are principles in how to deal with the differences between the youth of Ahl Sunnah so it's very important to know whenever you're writing something uh, who you're who is going to read what you're writing who is your audience and the purpose of the treaties and whenever you're studying something you should also know who the treaties was written for and what is the purpose behind the uh, the treaties that you're reading or studying and that will give you additional understanding about whatever you're studying you know when you know who it was written for then you'll have uh, a better understanding in general of the treaties so this treatise was written for Ahl Sunnah so due to the differences between people regarding these complex issues even in places where Muslims are a minority and Ahl Sunnah is even less that you'll see the people they differ in Masail Almiya and Masail Amaliya meaning Masail Almiya meaning those issues which pertain to knowledge knowledge based issues like regarding and again keeping in mind this is for Ahl Sunnah regarding the issue of uh, you know, maybe the condi conditions for takfir or when to, uh, when and how to declare someone an innovator or when to make hajr, you know, to uh, abandon someone for their sins or for their, uh, for their innovation in the religion. Uh, those are issues, those are masail almiya, those are issues, those are knowledge-based issues and those are actually very big issues that not everyone should be engaged in and talking about and and you know considering themselves an authority on which is a big problem that we've had uh, with a lot of the youth and the other issues are the Masail Amaliyah and this has, has to do with how we practice you know uh, these are issues on, on how to practice those issues those knowledge based issues so for example, in the, related to those issues that we just talked about, how to, like for example, the practice of dealing with Ahl Bidah. How do we deal with them, for example, in a particular city, in a particular locality? How do you, how do you re deal with them? A group of brothers may think, no, 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 you, you have to, um, you should be speaking about those particular individuals. Those individuals should not 
be in your masjid or, you know, or whatever the, the situation. They should not be giving lectures in your masjid or you should, you know, make hajjir from them, you know, or abandon them. And another group of individuals might say, no, 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 no. We see um, that there is benefit in not being harsh with these people, but rather we see that they're coming closer to the sunnah by our uh, gentleness with them. So these are issues, these are masail ilmiya, and and how they're being dealt with are have to do with issues related to the practice of dealing with those issues, those those knowledge based issues. And so, due to the many differences that has come about with be with many of the youth of Ahl Sunnah, many of the students of knowledge, the duat, and unfortunately, even amongst the ulama, even amongst the scholars, you'll find these differences that the Sheikh this encouraged him to write this treatise. And in fact, the differences are to such a big, uh, ha have, have become so immense, unfortunately, amongst even youth of Ahl Sunnah, that, uh, you know, amongst the Salafi'een, amongst the Salafis, that you'll find individuals, they're from Ahl Sunnah, cursing other individuals of Ahl Sunnah, or giving them uh, vile names, you know, name calling, accusing them of innovation. Or even sometimes to the extent certain individuals might even lie about other individuals. Or, and it builds up to where there becomes hatred and physical confrontation and uh, abandonment of one another. And this goes on between sometimes, between Ahl Sunnah. And what illustrates for us, or gives us a, a way in general of how we should look and deal with these things, the Prophet ﷺ said, فَمَنْ يَعِيشُ, فمن يعيش مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِ فَسَيَرَى اخْتِلَافٍ كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةَ خُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيينَ So the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever lives after me, that they will see many differences and so this is what this treatise is trying to address. But it's trying to address the, the differences between Ahl Sunnah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, So you will see many differences. Uh, and it is upon you my Sunnah. So he gave us the remedy there. That in order to deal with those differences, it's going back to the Quran, and it's going back to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and the understanding of the Salaf al-Saleh. And even then there are some issues on how, when it comes to how to practice them where the people differ on. And they can differ because of a, a one particular, uh, an individual or a particular uh, group of individuals could have a misunderstanding about a certain issue. So it could be a, uh, their lack of knowledge. Or it could be that they are using evidence which is not sahih, it's not authentic evidence or they're taking some evidence and they're leaving others there's many different reasons which cause these differences which is not necessarily the uh, focus of of what we're going to discuss here but we just want to give some uh, background about you know why these these issues um, why they get to this level and these this levels of uh, disagreeance and we'll talk a little bit more about those issues as we get into the treaties. So, the Sheikh Hafadullah Ta'ala is a professor of the Islamic University of Medina. And he also teaches in the Prophet Wasallam's masjid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. And I'm going to uh, use the translation of our brother Abu Zubair Hafadullah Ta'ala. Uh, predominantly for this treatise. And so the Sheikh began his treatise by saying, and, and, and another thing I want to point out before we get into it, is that this is not the more recent version of the Sheikh's treatise. This is the original version and it was translated. So now there has been uh, additional, uh, there's been a lot added to this uh, Risala. And, you know, especially about the issues of making hajjur, of when to abandon someone and some of those conditions relating to it. But we're going to just stick with this, the initial treaties, and 
go into it and, and bring about some benefits that I was able to gain from listening to the sheikh's explanation of the treaties and some other mashaykh also explaining it in their uh, lectures by going through it and making ta'liqat or making little uh, commentary on the sheikh's treaties. So the sheikh began by saying, All praises for Allah, Lord of all that exists, and may peace and blessings be upon the, uh, our Prophet Muhammad wasallam and his family and companions. To proceed, the obligation of giving nasiha has necessitated the compilation of this treatise to advise the youth of Ahl Sunnah, also as an effort to bring about reconciliation between them in light of the textual evidences which encourage rectification. This effort was initiated due to the existence of discord and differing in the issues of Aqidah and the etiquettes and positions taken when dealing with those who oppose Ahl Sunnah which is prevalent amongst the Muslim youth in various Islamic countries, even amongst the Muslim minorities who reside in the lands of, uh, of non-Muslims. So a point I want to make out here is, as the Sheikh mentioned, and, and as it was mentioned in, his, in, in one of the explanations of the Sheikh's treaties, is that even in non-Muslim lands, for example, in America, in Canada, in Britain, and wherever, that the people, those differences have become so vast and so uh, acerbated, exacerbated between some of the youth that even there are real stories that have been related of, you know, people who are new Muslims actually leaving the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who amongst us would like to be responsible for that? For actually scaring someone away from not just the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu but scaring someone away from the religion in general because of all the confusion. New Muslims. I remember when I first came to Medina, there was a particular brother and he had some, uh, some mukhalifat, he had some mistakes because uh, I, you know, some of the issues that we discussed and he made some comments about some of the scholars. But a point that he made that was very valid, he said that, subhanAllah, he said that we have individuals in the West who are like, uh, who claim and also they've relied so much on the translated material that they claim to be um, knowledgeable about the science of jarh you know, to be to be uh, knowledgeable about criticizing and uh, praising individuals about you know about about this science which relates to the narrators of hadith and it also relates to you know um, criticizing those people who uh, who have went astray who have deviated or who have made a mistake in aspects of the religion. And so there are individuals who claim to have this knowledge, but in fact they can only have so much knowledge if they don't know the Arabic language even, and they uh, have gotten to such a level of, of ignorance, and then which actually evolves out of that sometimes is arrogance, that some of these individuals, the, the people praise them so-and-so, he is, uh, mashallah, he's a talib al-ilm, and he is very knowledgeable about Jarwa Ta'dil, but he doesn't know how to read Surah Al-Fatiha properly. And this was a real, uh, it was narrated to me by this particular individual, uh, this, this, uh, re this, this statement, subhanAllah. So it shows you, and we've seen countless times, we've seen this ourselves. I know a particular individual, he told me that, you know, and this individual used to be a Sufi. And Allah favored him to be guided to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He said he went back to one of the cities in America. And the people, the first thing they did in this particular, he came across some brothers from Ahl Sunnah bi idnillah, or at least they claimed to be from Ahl Sunnah, and they made imtihan of him, meaning they tested him to see who his scholars were. This is the individual who left Sufism, who is now on the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Now he is Salafi. And this particular individual didn't know about certain scholars, certain Arab scholars, who their works are not even translated into English. And one of the, I'll, I'll just mention, I might as well mention it because it's a big hot topic now on some of the websites, is about Abu Hassan al-Misri. 
Abu Hassan Ma'rabi. And he is a sheikh from uh, Egypt who, te- who lives in Yemen and has a merkaz there, who many, many of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah have made tibdi of him, have called, declared him an innovator for his many, many issues of where he went astray and left the minhaj of Ahl Sunnah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide him back to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu So, they made empty hand of this particular individual who's practically like a new Muslim. You know, mashallah, you know, I mean, alhamdulillah, he left th- that minhaj and he came to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And they said, what is your position about Abu Hassan? This was some years ago. He said, I, you know, honestly, akhi, I don't, I don't know Arabic and I, I don't even know who he is. I don't, ma salama. Subhanallah. This, this individual related this to me himself. And even in the lectures when I was listening to, I listened to two different explanations of this treatise from the sheikh himself and another one of the mashayikh, and both of them mention a story just like this as well. Subhanallah. So it shows us that people need to prioritize and atlub al-ilm. Seek the knowledge, seek that which is going to benefit you, not with that which is going to lead you astray. And don't make empty hand of the people, you know, you know, test the people with things they have, you know, that are have of no benefit and the people don't even know about. That's not going to benefit them. That's not al-nafiyah. Wallah musta'an. So the Shaykh went on to say, this has resulted in separation, hajr, you know, to abandon, abandon uh, individuals. Even transgression and infringements against the rights of one another amongst Ahlul Sunnah. Because remember, this treatise is for the youth of Ahlul Sunnah, which has magnified the fitna amongst them and intensified its seriousness. This has affected the path that the dawah of calling people to the Sunnah has taken. Rather, it has even prevented some people from embracing this dawah after having already begun to embark upon it in many countries and localities. Therefore, I will restrict this piece of advice to the following points in which I implore Allah to provide me with ikhlas in my intention to do so, to grant me accuracy in my statements and to benefit any Muslim who reads it. Amin. Uh, SubhanAllah, that shows us that the how that affects the dawah and how that affects the image as we know that even you know unfortunately you hear in many places many people are scared of the salafis they're scared of the term salafis and when we're talking about related to these treaties and related to this advice the sheikh is giving advice in general to the youth of ahl sunnah He's not saying that uh, all the youth of Ahl Sunnah and all the Salafis or what have you have fallen into this. No. But he's giving a general advice to protect us from that. That some individuals from amongst us sometimes fall into these errors and that they and that there's different, there's differing. There's some people who tend to be more extreme, and there's some people who be who tend to be mutasahal, they go to the other extreme, as they say, mumayya, that they kind of throw away the principles of Ahl Sunnah in order to peace others. And this will be addressed in the treaties as well. And another important point that I want to say that I witnessed myself in living in uh, the Medina, Medina to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there was a time when a, a fitna that befell us after the fitna of, of Abi Hassan al-Ma'rabi, there was another particular individual who also, you know, made tabdi of this particular sheikh, Sheikh, uh, sheikh Ibrahim, and, and many other mashayikh. And he was very extreme, and he did this without any evidences. And many of the people followed him in this, unfortunately. He was leading, misleading a lot of people astray. And the point I want to make here is at the end of that fitna, when some of the major scholars finally put this other scholar in his place, may Allah guide him back to the sunnah, that that some the people were so shook up that some of the people who were so super harsh before, they went to the other extreme. And I met many of them that I remember when they were in their peak of their harshness. When they would not even sit with you to drink tea because they had to test you first. And they looked at you with suspicion. Then after that, 
they stopped going. I, I met a particular individual. I was at the park with my children, and he was at the park with his children. And he went to the other extreme, that now, at that point, he didn't even sit with the scholars anymore because of the conf he got so confused. And this confusion results from one thing is from blindly following the scholars and not seeking knowledge and gaining those principles so that way you can distinguish at least to a, li a greater or lesser extent between truth and falsehood. That you cannot accept the mistakes of anyone. You cannot accept the mistakes of anyone. Because then if you do, when that person, if that person goes down, you're tying your hereafter up with them. If you are trying to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by what they are doing and you follow them in everything, you can fall astray. So people become confused because then when the person that they had followed and trusted with, with their, you know, as following and seeking knowledge and stuff like this, they trusted this individual. That individual fell and, beca and, and became metruq, that the people left him. The youth left him. The scholars, his, his, the brothers amongst the scholars, they spoke about him and they, made, they refuted him and his mistakes and he only became more and more arrogant. From that, individual, some individuals were shook up. I even heard about particular students of knowledge jumping out, wanting to jump out of windows and stuff like this because they were so confused. So that shows you the danger that, you know, Ahl Sunnah has a middle path, that we love our scholars and we love the, the students of knowledge, but we do not tie up our hereafter in blind following anyone. And the safest thing that you can do is adhere to the statements of the major scholars. And in this time, Mashaykh like Sheikh Salah bin Fuzan, Sheikh Abdul Masin al Abad, Sheikh uh, Lu Haydan, and many, many others, Sheikh Saleh Ali Sheikh, and there's many, mashallah, tabarakallah, that we can benefit from in order to protect ourselves. And getting back to the treaties, so the sheikh said, the, he mentioned the first point. He said, firstly, from the established principles in the religion of Islam is that the Muslims should greatly emphasize the reformation and islah, or, you know, the, uh, of his own self. And this is what we talked about in our lecture about Tazkiyat and Nafs, that we should purify our own soul. And that was also by our sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim al-Rahili, hafadallahu ta'ala. And that we should work diligently towards securing the su success. The individual should work sincerely and diligently towards securing the success of his own soul and distance himself from those things which would bring about his destruction before he concerns himself with others, as Allah says in the Quran, By the time, Verily man is in a loss, except those who believe and do righteous actions and exhort one another to the truth and exhort one another to patience. So in this ayat the Shaykh mentions, Allah is informing us here of those who safeguard themselves from loss and ruin. They are the ones who actualize and adorn themselves with the characteristics mentioned therein, which are developing true iman. Secondly, performing righteous deeds. And thirdly, calling and exhorting one another to the truth. And fourthly, exhorting one another to patience. And that's exactly what Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala said in the Sulu Falatha. He said, إِنَّهُ يَعْجِبُ عَلَيْنَ تَعَلَمْ أَرْبَعَ مَسَائِلْ الْأُولَىٰ الْعِلْمِ وَهُوَ مَعْرَفَةَ اللَّهُ وَمَعْرَفَةَ النَّبِي وَمَعْرَفَةَ دِينَ الْإِسْلَامِ بِيَدِّلَّةِ He said, it's an obligation upon us to, um, to, to gain knowledge. On, on all the Muslims. Firstly, it's knowledge, uh, you know, gaining that beneficial knowledge, which is knowing Allah, knowing the Messenger, and knowing the religion of Islam with the textual proof. Wathaniya, an amilu bi. The second thing is practicing. Athalatha, da'wah to ilay. The third thing is, is making da'wah after that. So it means you are practicing and you're making da'wah. And may Allah forgive us all for our taqseer and our many sins that we do. And even we try to call and rectify others. But a lot of times we don't rectify ourselves. May Allah forgive us and give us guidance. I mean. And so this is. And uh, the fourth thing. And the fourth thing is exhorting one another to patience. And that's what Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab said. And this is in conjunction with what the, the Sheikh was saying in his treaties. 
Allah criticized and dishonored Bani Israel for objecting and opposing this principle. As he said, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسِ بِالْبِرْ وَتَنْسُونَ أَنفُسُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْكِلُونَ Do you enjoy uh, al-bir, piety and righteousness, on the people and you forget to practice it yourselves? While you recite the book, meaning the Torah, uh, have you then no sense? So we have to be cautious about calling to something and we're not practicing it. Therefore, it is important for the youth of Ahlul Sunnah to emphasize and concern themselves with their own reformation before they try to reform others. And when they become upright themselves and combine the... Uh, and, and combine, you know, exemplifying the religion of, of Allah within, within themselves and calling others to it, then at that point, they will truly be upon the methodology and guidance of the Salaf, and Allah will bring about benefit for the people by their hands, and they will be true callers to the Sunnah uh, in statement and action. This, by Allah, is the highest level that one can attain, and if given tawfiq to follow it, they would then be from the most honorable servants of Allah in the status in status on the day of judgment. As Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسِنْ قَوْلٍ مِمَّنْ دَاعِ لَلَّهِ وَعَمَلَ الصَّالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنِّي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And who is better in speech than he who says, My Lord is Allah, and then stands firm on this and invites the people to Allah's uh, tawheed, monotheism, does righteous deeds and says, I am one of the Muslims. So giving da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something great indeed and raises you in ranks of righteousness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's ample adilla from the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that we've mentioned in many of the lectures, which is not necessary to go into now because we want to get through our treaties, bi Allah ta'ala. Some of the things the Shaykh said in his explanation of his treaties, he said sometimes people call to the sunnah by statements, but they lack, uh, they lack actions. And some people, they have actions without statements. Okay? So some people, they call to the sunnah with their, with their statements, you know, inviting people to sunnah, inviting people to come to lectures, inviting people to this, to the good. But they are weak in their own practice. You know, they're weak in their own actions. Maybe their manners are def deficient. And then some people, they have good actions, but they're not, they're, they don't ever call people verbally. You know, they're not good with statements. Maybe they don't have the ability, or maybe they're just deficient in that manner, or what have you, in calling to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The tawfiq, you know, that acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that, that, uh, that uh, blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is for whoever does both of those things. Whoever, in their actions, and in their statements that they 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 make da'wah ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the person that has tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so uh, another point the shaykh mentioned he mentioned he said we do not adhere to, to names we do not adhere to names we do not adhere to names or anyone besides the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam meaning calling ourselves a group like this or group this or some sect like this, but rather we adhere to the statements and the actions of the Prophet ﷺ. And no one has the, uh, the truth all the time except the Prophet ﷺ, meaning that someone can be, as the statements of the Salaf would indicate and, and illustrate that everyone's statement can be at some point or time refuted, except the Prophet wasallam, And this is a paraphrase of the statement of Imam Malik, rahimahullah uh, ta'ala. And so we have to be cautious and maintain ourselves on the minhaj of the Prophet wasallam, And that we're not on the minhaj, we don't say I'm on the minhaj of Sheikh so-and-so. Because the methodology of Sheikh so-and-so is conditional. Only if what he is doing and what he understands in Islam and propagates as Islam is, in, is related to the Sunnah and comes from the Sunnah of the Prophet That's why we follow the methodology of the Prophet And everyone's statements 
uh, can can be and should be analyzed to see if they are in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and that will prevent some of the fitna that we that I was discussing earlier, in which some people they go astray because they believe uh, that the truth lies in every issue that comes up with Sheikh so and so, or Sheikh so and so, or this student of knowledge. No, it the, their statements have to be put up in accordance with the book and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam and the understanding of the Salaf al-Salih. Then the Shaykh went on to, to say the second point. It is imperative to know that Ahl Sunnah are the first ones to thoroughly exemplify the religion of Islam, whether in the issues of Aqidah, Creed, or Saluk in manners and etiquettes. It is from a restricted understanding and outlook to believe that the Sunnah or the Salafi is one who only exemplifies the creed of Islam without emphasizing the appropriate Islamic manners and etiquettes. So the Shaykh is showing that that's false. You know, our minhaj is complete. And discharging the rights that are due to every Muslim from amongst them. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said towards the end of his book in, uh, in Al-Aqidah al-Wasatiyya, uh, after mentioning the principles of Ahl sunnah and related to Aqidah, Shaykh al-Islam said, and they, Ahl sunnah along with these principles, enjoin the good and forbid the evil based upon the legislative guidelines of the Kitab and the Sunnah. They see the obligation of performing Hajj and Jihad and Jumu'ah and the uh, Eid prayers alongside the Muslim ruler, whether they are righteous or whether they are wicked and disobedient. They work diligently, this is Ahl Sunnah, they work diligently to preserve the Muslim community. They deem it a part of the religion to give Nasiha, to give advice to the Ummah and believe wholeheartedly in the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the believer to another believer is like one solid structure, one part strengthening the other, then he interlocked his fingers to demonstrate and in the statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the example of the believers in their love, mercy and kindness for one another is like one body, if one part aches then the rest of the body calls on each other with fervor and vigilance they, so Ahl Sunnah, they exhort one another with patience in times of trial and with gratitude in times of ease and with being content with the bitter and unpleasant obstacles that are decreed for them. You know, in, in the Qadr, khayrihi wa shar. They call one another to exemplify good behaviors and etiquettes in dealing with others and they believe in the statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most complete of the believers in Iman are those who have the best character. Ahl Sunnah, they consider it praiseworthy uh, to join relations with those that cut them off and to give to the one who withholds from giving to them and to pardon the one who transgressed against them. These are the characteristics of Ahl Sunnah. That's what it takes. It takes that the, that the ibadah is in everything. It's not just that we, we emphasize Aqidah, Aqidah Awul, Tawheed Awul. This is the first thing is Tawheed, monotheism. That's what's going to get us to paradise. But these other, the religion is complete. As the Prophet ﷺ said, The Prophet ﷺ said, There isn't a thing that will weigh heavier on the scale of the believers than good manners. And verily, Allah hates hateful and sinful speech. And many hadith about uh, having good manners. That's from the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. That is our minhaj. Our minhaj is that. Our minhaj is, you know, that we call to people to the khair and that we're patient with the people and that we exert, uh, exhort to the haq and exhort people to patience. <laughs> then the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, they command one another to be kind to their parents, to keep family ties and to be good neighbors. They caution against arrogance and speaking about people excessively, whether rightfully or without just cause. So even sometimes it's, it's the it's a qawla haq. Sometimes it's rightfully. It's not, you know, sometimes it is a correct thing to do. But then maybe it's not beneficial to be excessive in that. Fine. We made refutation of this brother or this sister for their, their mistakes that they made or that the bid'ah that they fell into or the fact that, you know, yeah, that, you know, that whatever the mistakes they made and that, that was sufficient. But to kin continue on and on and on, every lecture, every khutbah, it's in the khutbah. 
The people, you know, need something for their soul, but yet we're making the chutbah about this individual and, the, and, and this girl and this person, their sins. No. That Ahlul Sunnah puts everything in its rightful place. So whether speaking about them rightfully or without just cause, they command one another to have the most excellent character and manners and caution against the most repugnant of them. They follow the book and the sunnah and their methodology in Islam, which Allah sent Muhammad wasallam with. That was the statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And I'm just going to mention a couple of quick points and then we'll finish. So Ahl sunnah does not require anything. This is what Shaykh Ibrahim Rahili said in uh, his uh, ta'liqat, his um, commentary about on his own treatise when he was uh, explaining it. He said, Ahl sunnah does not require anything from other methodologies. The minhaj of Ahl sunnah the minhaj of the Salaf al-Saleh, the Salafi minhaj, does not need anything. It's, it's sufficient because it's from Allah and it's from the Prophet Sallallahu and it's from the method, it's from the understanding of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu It's not sufficient. But others, other groups, other methodologies, other manahij, other madahib, they require from Ahlul Sunnah. They should, are, are deficient in what they have. Maybe some emphasize only good manners, but they don't practice many things of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu They build their whole religion. They don't even emphasize Aqidah, for example. Or something else. Other ones they emphasize being very po political. But they forget the importance of just Tawheed. Or the importance of uh, other aspects of the religion. And so they require from Ahl Sunnah. They require from the Minhaj, of the, minhaj al Haq. But Ahl Sunnah doesn't require from them. You may find shortcomings in individuals from Ahl Sunnah. But it doesn't reflect the Minhaj. It doesn't reflect the methodology of Ahl Sunnah. And always a group from them are on good. You will always find a group of Ahl Sunnah on the Haq. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Mazizal Taifatum min Ummati Dahirin al Haq. That you there won't cease to be a group from amongst my community clearly on the truth. And Ahl Sunnah, the Salafiyun, will not gather together on mistakes and misguidance. And this is uh I don't know if it's an authentic if it's a hadith, but we've heard it many, many times from uh, the Mashaykh, and I just recently listened to it in Aqidah to Tahawiyah with Sheikh Salih bin Fauzan's explanation, and he was just uh, mentioned this very statement, and Sheikh Ibrahim Rahili also mentioned this, and Kathra min ulama mentioned the statement. And those are some of the very important things that we want to remember, is that our religion is complete, and the methodology is complete, the minhaj is complete. And so, although you may find mistakes with individuals sometimes, we all fall into mistakes. All the children of Adam make mistakes, and the best of those are those who repent. So all of us make mistakes and have shortcomings. But the methodology has no shortcomings. So you're going to find sometimes uh, a student of knowledge who makes uh, shortcomings. Maybe he's not good in his manners, but he's, he's really good uh, in his statements. Or maybe you see even deficiency in his practice. But he's very good. He has good sound knowledge. Or Bill Axe, you'll have an individual, his knowledge is limited. But his, uh, his manners are impeccable. Okay? That doesn't take away from Ahl Sunnah. And that doesn't take them necessarily, uh, that doesn't take them off the, the methodology of Ahl Sunnah. But those deficiencies do not reflect the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. They do not reflect upon Ahl Sunnah. And this is what has to be clarified in, and, and brought to the attention, especially the people of, of, uh, of, you know, who are not on the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. that they need to be shown that Ahl Sunnah emphasizes everything. We emphasize good manners because we're following the, the manners of the Prophet Wasallam. That's what it means to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet. Who is, that's what it means to follow the Salaf is that we follow them in everything. I mean, we follow the Prophet Wasallam in everything. And that is the final point that I want to make, and that's sufficient for us now. And inshallah ta'ala, our next sitting, we will continue on in the treaties, bi'idhnillah ta'ala. And anything I said that was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad.